So we're going to talk about the governor's race. And a couple of gentlemen uh, here have been kind enough to grace us with their presence. And they're very busy, of course, this time of year. And they, I think, have already set the state record for the most uh, debates by gubernatorial candidates. And I think they're to be applauded for that. Uh, let's give them a round of applause for being so willing to do this. Now, the format will be as follows. We uh, have already introduced the candidates, but each candidate will be given two minutes for their opening statements. That will be followed by questions, uh, some of which have already been submitted by those of you in the audience, and I'll have a couple of my own. And then uh, a little bit after 7 o'clock, uh, 7 5, 7 10 or so, we're going to open it up to any questions you might have live here in the audience, and Jody will be in the back of the room, the woman with the red coat, and she'll uh, have a microphone with her. But without any further ado, let's go alphabetically uh, on our opening statements and begin with Tom Emmer, the Republican candidate for governor. Tom. Thank you, Tom. Are, are you, what do you got, bells or guns that you shoot off? No, we're in the hospital. It'll be some kind of stat, right? I uh, thank you all for being here. Looking forward to the discussion with uh, Tom and with the rest of you. Uh, we get two minutes for this, so I'm going to be very quick and talk to you just about the message. I see great opportunities in this state and in this country today. I know that a lot of people don't feel that way. A lot of people are getting up every day and they're worried about this country. They're worried about the direction the state and the country are going. They're worried about their job, their family. They're worried about whether or not their kids are going to have the opportunity for a better life than we've had. And after all, that's what every parent wants for his or her child is in this country, uh, I believe in the world, is that they have an opportunity for a better life than we've had. A lot of concern, but I see a time of great opportunity. Yes, we have major economic challenges, but it's a time that we meet those challenges. That's what Minnesotans do. That's what Americans do. When times are tough, we get moving. What's the message that we're delivering? While everybody else talks about needing more revenue, which is uh, we must raise taxes, uh, my colleagues believe you've got to raise taxes. Government has to keep growing. Uh, government folks cannot continue at the state that it's going. You've got uh, end of the biennium in 1999, we were spending roughly $30 billion total. End of the biennium in 2009, we're spending $60 billion total, roughly. At this stage, uh, by 2019, if you continue, you're spending $120 billion. The math doesn't work. It is time to look at what government does. It's time to rebuild government, redesign it from the ground up, have it deliver the services that people expect in an affordable, sustainable manner so we turn over something other than just our debt to our kids. And then we have to address the real problem in this state. It's an economic problem. We have to create an environment that is attractive to not only our existing businesses so they can grow, but also to new investment. We must start to grow jobs again in our private economy. Once you start growing jobs, you will grow new revenues and you will be able to pay for the services that you and I expect government to provide. Looking forward to a great discussion tonight. Thank you so much <laughs> for having me. And thank you very much, Tom Emmer. We now turn to the Independence Party candidate for governor, Tom Horner. Well, thank you very much. Thank you to, thank you. Thank you to Sarah and everybody at, at Health East and St. Joe's for hosting us, to the Chambers of Commerce, to uh, Kincaid's and St. Paul Hotel, and everybody <laughs> for, for having us here. So let me start just by correcting my friend Tom on one point. I don't think it's so important for, for the government to grow. I think it's important for Minnesota to grow. I think it's important for Minnesota to have new opportunities, for Minnesota to craft new solutions for the future. And you know that in healthcare maybe better than anybody else. I mean, look what's happening right here at, at St. Joe's with your telescope care, where neurologists from St. Joe's can bring their expertise to Glencoe, to other communities around the state with, with a level of, of expertise where they can look in the pupils of a patient's eyes and in, in a, an environment in which, as the saying goes, time is brain cells, they can help make those decisions immediately. They can make them with expertise. And they can make them at a level that isn't possible if it's just that hospital, that doc in Glencoe working on his or her own. That takes high-speed internet connections. That takes some public investment. We're not a state that can say, we'll just do away with government. We'll just try to, to figure out the status quo. We'll just say to the private sector, you're great, go it alone. I do believe the private sector is great. But I also believe there's a role for government, a smart role for government. And that's what I offer in this campaign. You know, where we have Democrats saying, 
take the status quo and we'll just make it a lot larger by taxing. Republicans saying, oh no, we'll just do away with the status quo. My answer, for so many Minnesotans, the status quo isn't working. And that's what we need to change with new solutions. Not just crafting a little bit from this, a little bit from that, but new solutions, new approaches. That's what I offer, and I too look forward to the conversation tonight. Thank you. <laughs> Isn't that the same signal they used to ward off vampires? Yeah. I think that you were. <laughs> yeah, I was waiting for the silver <laughs> steak to come out. <laughs> that might be next, <laughs> right. so be careful. Uh, among the many reasons you should be thankful that I'm not running for governor, could you imagine uh, trying to de decide between Tom Horner, Tom Emmer, and Tom Hauser? <laughs> that would have would have been mass confusion, I think, in the uh, polling place. Uh, let's begin uh, our first question. We will begin with uh, Tom Horner. We'll go in the opposite order of the opening statements. And again, you each have one minute to respond to these. I know it's never enough time, right. but I think you've probably been through this enough that you uh, will be able to handle it. Let's start with something that's been in the news just in the past week. Uh, Mr. Horner, do you agree or disagree with Governor Pawlenty's decision to not apply for some federal health care grants that he says might get the state too tied into the new federal health care overhaul? And along with that, do you agree with the decision to take the $260 million in Medicaid funding? Well, what I disagree with is the broad brush stroke that the, the governor laid out um, where, where he put the, the mandate out that he's not going to take any um, of the, the federal money without specific reviews. You know, we do have to look at each of these programs and make sure that the money can be used in a way that advances Minnesota's health care in a Minnesota way. We've done a lot of good things in the state. We have a good foundation to build on. But we also have the opportunity to use federal health reform to leverage it in a way that works for Minnesota. So would I have accepted the $260 million? Of course. And, and we knew the governor was going to do that. I mean, that was money that in January he had said is going to be part of the, the budget, of last year's budget, and the federal government didn't act quickly enough. But I'd go it a step further. I believe that we also ought to take the early opt-in to Medicaid. I've set aside the money in my budget because I think that's an important step, and I presume we'll have more time to talk about that as well. And Tom Emmer? Well, when it comes to uh, what the governor's doing, I have to be uh, clear, I haven't read the grant proposals. I don't know exactly what he was doing and why. I uh, trust him to do that, and I guess the uh, statement when he says that uh, every offering from the federal government should be scrutinized, I think that's wise. I think that before you just automatically except federal dollars, you should start doing a due diligence and make sure that you are not committing the state of Minnesota to future financial liabilities that we may not be able to afford. These, uh, some of these maintenance of effort provisions, et cetera, can be a real problem for, uh, for future legislatures for the taxpayers. I think you have to do that due diligence with everything. The money that the governor just took, I'm told uh, without reading the entire program, did not have strings attached, but I do have concerns because it appears that at the county level it will, cre uh, it will create potentially some maintenance of effort situations that might put our already strapped counties in a position where they've got to answer for something in the future. We should always be concerned about what we're looking at um, when, it, when the money runs out. And let's stick with uh, Tom Emmer here. Uh, along these same lines, Governor Pawlenty uh, last spring uh, turned down $1.4 billion in Medicaid expansion money that would have required the state to pony up, I believe, $188 million in order to access that money. The next governor will have another window of opportunity in January uh, to decide whether or not to take that money. If you are elected governor, what would you do? Well, at this point, I would say no, and I have said no, and I know my colleague uh, feels differently about it, but this goes to the very essence of what Minnesota is all about. I know we have hospitals, perhaps the one that we're in right now, that are saying, this is free money. This is something we need to access. I look at it a little differently based on what I have read. Uh, it's not just $188 million that we're committing. Over three years, you're talking closer to $430 million that the state will have to get. More importantly, what it does is it is based, it puts us in that same uh, formula that the federal government reimburses us on, which is on volume of care. Minnesota prides itself on high quality, low cost care. Uh, the federal program that we are being offered would allow, would only reimburse based on volume of services. That may be good for North and South Dakota, Iowa, Wisconsin. It's not for Minnesota. We need to protect what is the innovation in Minnesota, the quality of health care, 
Uh, and again, this is one of those areas where if you take this money, you are committing not only to $430 million over the next three years, but there's no guarantee the money will be here or that it will be here after 2014. And Tom Horner, your thoughts on this? Well, this is an area where Tom and I disagree. I don't think St. Joe's or any hospital says this is free money. I think quite the contrary. They say this is plugging a hole of lost money if we don't take it. And that's the reality. And that's the reality of health care is that if we don't do these kinds of things, if we don't expand coverage reasonably, building on the, the foundation that, that Minnesota has, has established, we don't save money. Health care is a tax either that we're going to pay directly or we're going to pay indirectly. Either it's going to come on employers like I was before I started this campaign through higher insurance premiums that I have to pay for my employees, that they pay higher out-of-pocket costs, higher property taxes if you happen to live in Hennepin County and some other counties to pay for the failure of the legislature and the governor to address this, this issue reasonably. It is not free money. It is not lost money. It is money that we will pay one way or the other. We ought to do it in a way that builds a stronger health care system. All right, our next question is one that was submitted by the audience. And Tom Horner, we will begin with you. Would you leave all of the money that is collected from physicians and dentists and others for the health care access fund to be used only for its primary purpose, uh, Medicaid, you know, health insurance for lower income Minnesotans, rather than uh, take that money and use it to try to balance the budget? Absolutely. I mean, I think this was a real lost opportunity for Minnesota to, again, not show the leadership of using this money that was passed as a way to, to provide and build a stronger health care system in Minnesota. So we ought to use it for health care purposes, not dump it in the general fund as has been done to pay for, for general purposes for the, the government. Now, we do have an opportunity coming into 2014 um, with the, the federal reform that will take over some of these programs to figure out what do we do with that provider tax. Do we use it in a way that, that can build a stronger health care system? Do we end the tax? Do we end part of the tax? I mean, I think those are the kinds of questions that we ought to start asking right now so that we can be thoughtful, so that we can plan ahead. And that's part of the opportunity Minnesota has to leverage federal health reform in a way that can provide lower cost, higher quality health care for all Minnesotans. A stronger system that is going to work better for businesses, for individuals, for providers, for communities, for the whole state. Tom Emmer? Yeah, I don't think you're uh, attacking it that way, though. I, I think it goes back to even the last question. First off, uh, the sick tax should be eliminated. Uh, it, there is a different way to handle uh, these programs, and we need to start to lead. And what, what I'm hearing is, frankly, what we've been doing. I mean, if, if we're going to opt into uh, early medical uh, Medicaid because, uh, and I'm sorry, maybe I shouldn't have said free money, but people think it's money that's going to come without strings attached and it's going to solve our existing problem, we're just going to be back here in the next three or four years again. Let's start talking about how we solve the problem for the long term instead of just taking what the federal co government is giving us and saying, well, this is going to get us through another two or three years. We've got to start leading from Minnesota. And on this issue, we've got to reform the programs, Minnesota Care and GAMC, other programs like it that are supported, uh, Minnesota Care in particular, from the health care access account. There's a different way to do this, and we can talk about that as we go forward. But we've got to start looking at doing it a different way because if we continue down this road, you cannot survive. I, I respectfully disagree. All right. Uh, who did we start with that last time? Was it uh, you? So we'll start with Tom Emmer. Another question from the audience. Uh, total health care spending is expected to nearly double in the next 10 years. That figure fluctuates a lot, but we know it's going to go up and go up a lot. Uh, the question is kind of broad, so I'll try to narrow it down. How would you address the rising cost of health care? Why don't you give us, uh, both Tom and Tom, three uh, key items, three places you would start uh, to begin to rein in health care spending? Can I ask uh, for clarification? <laughs> Can I yes. phone a friend? <laughs> uh, <laughs> clarification would be, uh, are you talking about for the public programs uh, versus how we would uh, attack uh, the cost issue in the private health care market? Yeah, I, I mean, they're two different things. Let's assume it's the health care cost in the, in the private market. Let's assume in that's the private marketplace. Yeah. All right. Because that impacts more people. So mm -hmm. what, what are three things you would do? Uh, first off, I would give individuals the same opportunity to deduct their health care insurance premium expenses that right now we only give to employers. Uh, second, I would uh, want to see more pooling options and more choice for the consumer. 
We need to allow us, the patient, we need to give the patient, the uh, consumer, the incentive to be more invested into their own health care. Give them the opportunity to create their own health care coverage by sitting down with their private health care insurance broker, going through the different coverages available. That means get rid of mandates and let people start to drive their own mandates and fit their coverages, and then give them an opportunity to pool with others similarly situated. Uh, and then the last uh, piece, if there's only three, because uh, I merged two together, so it was actually four. You can do more of, than three if you'd I like. Know it's if kind you of can sneaky. get that in a minute. But uh, I, I think we need to give you and I, again, empower the individual. Instead of having government tell us what's good for us, empower the individual to shop one of the 1,300 approved health insurance products across this country. We do it with auto insurance. We should start doing it with our health insurance. Give the consumer, the patient, more ownership of their own health care. They will take advantage of it. Your time is up. Tom Horner. I didn't well, get the cha cha changing the, the way we pay for health care doesn't change the underlying cost of health care, and that's really the problem. We've got to figure out a better health care system that expands access and manages the underlying cost. I mean, we can blame insurance companies, but they reflect the cost of, of care. They reflect what we're asking for. They reflect new technologies. They reflect an aging population. We've got to be smarter than that. So a couple of things. One is that we do need to invest in prevention. I'm willing to say that we ought to raise the price of tobacco because there is no good public policy that supports cheap cigarettes. And so we ought to have that disincentive. We ought to continue to coordinate care the way that Minnesota has already made advances so that we can manage the 5% of the people who consume 50% of the cost. Then I think we need to look for new s solutions. I mean, look what St. Joe's has done with the certified nurse midwives reducing the C-sections to 10 to 12 percent of births at St. Joe's, about one-third of the statewide average. It is those creative kinds of solutions, real solutions that deal with the underlying cost of care that we need to, uh, to address. All right, thank you very much. And Tom Horner, we will start with you on this next question. Uh, Sarah Krieger addressed this uh, briefly at the very beginning. The current GAMC program design looks like it's not working out so well uh, and is forcing the state's poorest and sickest into the emergency rooms. How would you fix that? Is there a way to fix this program? Sure. I mean, I don't think anybody in here is surprised that GAMC isn't working out so well. I think there are a lot of people in this room who a year and a half ago said what you're proposing isn't going to work out so well. Um, and so that it's not working out well, that, that St. Joe's now has an extra $3 million in uncompensated care, I think goes right to the issue that a lot of people talked about. The way we're going to deal with that, though, is to expand access. I think the way we're going to deal with that is to spend the money to do early opt-in to, to Medicaid to expand the access to make sure that people do have coverage, that they can get the care. Look, I mean, it is a lot cheaper to treat somebody with high blood pressure than it is to wait until they come into the emergency room and treat them for a stroke. That just is common sense. It is a lot cheaper to deal with people on, on GAMC many of them with mental health issues, and to deal with them as preventive care, help them live independent, sustainable lives, than it is to wait until they're in crisis. Those are the kinds of solutions we need. And again, Tom, you don't save money by saying we're going to reject the federal dollars. You just transfer it to hospitals, to and employers, to property taxpayers. And you're out of time. Tom Emmer. Well, actually, I think uh, when you just take the uh, lack of creativeness and say we're just going to keep doing what we're doing, give us more federal money, you don't solve the problem for the long term. When it comes to GAMC, General Assistance Medical Care, we're not treating these folks for high blood pressure. These, these are the poorest of the poor. You know that. These are roughly 40,000 people that we were spending $400 million on every two years in the last biennium. Yes, there was a solution that was negotiated by both sides of the aisle that reduced the amount of money available to 250,000 roughly, somebody can, 250 million, somebody can correct me. But the idea is we're gonna pinch the providers so that they have more incentive because there's not enough money there to get these people off their, out of their emergency rooms and on different programs, that doesn't work. This is what I have been talking about. We've got to look at that charity care, uh, the way the definition is used. We've got hospitals, clinics, doctors that want to provide the care. Every time you insert government into the business of charity, government is taking something out of it. It is time to empower the physicians that we have in this great state. Let them keep more of their hard-earned income by creating a situation where they can provide the charity care that they, they really want to provide. Get government out of the way. All right. Thank you both for those responses. Another question here. It's, it's a little bit vague. We'll try to narrow it down. I think I know where they're going with this. 
Uh, and Tom Emmer will start. I just ask for clarification, Tom, in this sure. la last answer. So, I, because you, you, you've kind of moved around on this issue, Tom, and I just want to be clear. Right. So, are you suggesting that low income care, the public health programs, now ought to be charity care? So, we're going to ask hospitals, providers, clinics to care for the low income, and in return, we'll give them some kind of tax credit, and that's going to cover the poorest of the poor? Actually, Tom, let's do it again because right. I hadn't moved around in this at all. I've been talking about it for 16 months, uh, and I'll try to make it more clear. We'll give you, you 30 seconds. Uh, yeah, if I can, <laughs> if it'll help. Because uh, over the years, as you know, since you've been uh, effectively, your firm has been a lobbyist for hospitals no, for a long lobby. time. No, we don't lobby. We've never lobbied, but well, thank you. Well, I'm sorry, uh, whatever the definition is. You've been right. representing hospitals for a yes. long time. The Probably government, so. the government has, uh, has squeezed the definition of charity care and how you balance your books. Uh, that's what I'm talking about. I'm talking about different from, and I'm surprised we differ on this because I thought you and I would, uh, would agree that the solutions that we have to start moving to are individual-based solutions, not big government solutions. What I'm talking about is trying to find a way to empower the physicians, the clinics, the hospitals that want to take care of these folks to get full credit for the care that they're providing. Right now, they get the short uh, end of the stick when they go to bill. They're, they're getting reimbursed at 1990 ra 1999 rates. Okay. we got to allow them to get full credit. Whatever that formula is, Tom, the idea is let's pull government back. Let's let people provide the charity that they want to provide and give them the incentive to keep more of their income while doing that. All right, we'll move on to our next audience question. Again, it's a little bit vague. We'll try to narrow it down. It says, do you think all employees are entitled to sick leave? I assume what they're talking about are people who maybe have part-time jobs where they're not covered by a benefits program and oftentimes if they take a day off from work, they just don't get any, any pay. Should the state get involved with that? And I forget who went first last time. Uh, I, I think. Because you asked the last question, so now I'm all, let's we'll start with you, <laughs> let's start with you. Tom Emmer. Oh, I get to ask yes. Tom a question? No, no you, <laughs> no. No, I'm sure you will before long, the, but uh, for no, now, no, I'll ask I, the question. I, I don't need to. We're, we're selling what we believe, and we're sharing that. In, in this case, should every employee be entitled to sick leave? I think that's up to the employer and the employee. That's an issue that's negotiated between uh, good employers with good employees. They determine how that's going to be handled. I don't think government has any business being involved in that. All right, I thought it might take you less than a minute to do that, Tom Horner. I defer the rest of my time to Tom Horner. <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> But you don't have to take it, Tom, if you don't want <laughs> and to. And I won't. So let me tell you the approach that I took when I was an employer who didn't lobby, uh, but, but worked <laughs> with very good clients that we were always proud of, including hospitals. You know, I felt that we did have a responsibility to our employees. And so we took all of our time off, vacation time, sick leave, holidays, and said it's personal time off. It's personal leave. And you can choose to use it in the way that you want. And so if you, the employee, have a, a sick parent, a sick child, and you need a day off, take a day off. You know, you get to make the choices. That's empowerment. I am going to trust employees to make good decisions around the time off. That's how we ought to, to work on this issue, not through mandates, but by encouraging employers to be responsible, to be smarter, to work with employees, particularly in this society changing where so many people now are caring either for young children or for aging parents. Just a couple more uh, questions that have been submitted ahead of time. Then uh, if any of you in the audience have a question you want to ask tonight, we'll do that in just a moment. Uh, but this is an interesting question. I don't think either of you needs a minute uh, to deal with this one, but it is interesting. Uh, and uh, Tom Horner, we'll start with you. Would you consider spending time in any Minnesota emergency room to see health care up front, even if it was just for half a day or a day? And do you think you'd learn something from that? Yes, I've done it, and I've learned a great deal, and I would be grateful and eager to do it again. You may be extended an invitation by somebody in this room, because that was just submitted tonight. Tom Emmer? Uh, absolutely, but please uh, keep in mind, Jackie and I have seven children. We spend an awful lot of time in emergency rooms <laughs> right now. <laughs> All right, on that note, again, Jody in the red jacket back there has a microphone. If anybody uh, in here right now has a question, you're just dying to ask one of these uh, candidates. We've got a question right up here. If we can have you step over this way so we can get you on camera. Thank you. And again, you'll each have a minute to address this. We'll begin with Tom Emmer after he asks the question. Sure. Uh, the University of Minnesota Medical School has a very high tuition and is under extreme financial pressure. What's your position regarding support of the medical school in view of the fact that the biotech industry, which is dependent on the medical school, school faculty in a variety of ways, is one of the state's largest industries? 
Tom Emmer, start with you. You got one minute. Well, first off, it's to stimulate more growth in those jobs. That's uh, number one. If Minnesota, which since 2005 has added over 2,200 jobs in state government, it, there's no other sector of our economy that has grown by 7% during the same time period. Uh, if you want the, the great University of Minnesota Medical School, the University of Minnesota itself, to not only uh, uh, survive but to thrive the way it should, then you've got to start not only allowing our existing businesses to grow again in this state, but you've got to start attracting those high-quality, high-paying jobs that drive the university and, frankly, drive everything else we expect out of government. So that's why we rolled out a jobs proposal that immediately starting in 2011, January 2011, will reduce the corporate tax, will we'll give a 10% exclusion on pass-through income in small businesses, LLCs, S-corporations, closely held corporations. That's the purpose of those proposals is to get an immediate stimulation in our economy to allow businesses to start to reinvest in people, which in turn drives more revenues, which in turn will support the great uh, schools that we have including the University of Minnesota Medical School. And Tom Horner? Well, this is an area where, again, we're not going to do it without government, even though Tom has voted against bonding bills that created the biosciences campuses at uh, the campus at the University of Minnesota. I mean, if you talk about the need to invest in life sciences, not just the med tech, but all of the other emergency, emerging life sciences, we need that research, basic and applied research at our four-year schools. We need the investment in the biosciences campus that has been created at the university, which right next door to it has a private sector campus, including venture capital. So we need those to, to create the revenue, to create the jobs, to create the money. I agree with all of that, but you don't do it without government. On the issue specifically of the high tuition, I think we do have to be wary of that. One of the great things, I mean, look at what's happening at the University of Minnesota Medical School at Duluth, where they have, I think it's one of the highest rates in the country of new physicians, primary care doctors, going into rural Minnesota to practice, getting some of the, the rebate. I think it's those kinds of programs that make sense for everybody that, again, we need to invest in now to save money, to produce better health, to produce a stronger Minnesota in the long run. All right, thank you both for those responses. Uh, do we have another question? Okay, I'm Bill Klein. I've been on the Inver Grove Heights City Council for 18 years. During that time, I've seen what we're paying for health care go up 10, 15, 20 percent almost every year, at least for the last five years. It's out of control. Our budgets haven't been going up. Our employees, their salaries are frozen for the last two years. You tell me why is health care escalating at such a drastic percentage? I want to hear from people why health care is probably the highest thing escalating that I can possibly think of. I'd like an answer to that. All right, Tom Warner, you got one minute to sure. solve this whole problem. Yeah, no problem. <laughs> <laughs> but I think, I think everybody in this room knows the answers. We want a lot of what we don't want to pay for. We're insulated from the cost. We're an aging society demanding more services. And we have a terrific health care system that is producing more and better and sometimes more expensive solutions. I mean, we're healthier, we have an opportunity to live longer. Diseases that were fatal not so long ago now are curable. We live healthier lives, we live longer lives because we have the opportunity to be healthy. We have to make fundamental changes. And it's not just by saying, let's treat it like auto insurance, where we have a rate book and you can say, all right, you have a dent in your right fender, that's going to cost X number of dollars. That's not how health care works. You can't just bring in a bunch of out-of-state insurance companies and say, okay, there we go, we've solved the problem. You can't turn the poor over to charity care and say, you take care of it, good luck. We still pay those costs. We need fundamental reforms. We need to figure out how do we have different outcomes based on a whole different approach to health care. That's what Minnesota is doing. That's the opportunity we have if we're smart about it and, and honest about it. And Tom Emmer, it's your turn. Yeah, I didn't realize we'd differ on this. Again, it's about markets. You know, the uh, state of Minnesota, the problem is uh, too much government involvement. We had great people back in the 70s. Uh, it's not a party thing. 
but they thought they could make a good system better and they started creating these different options to uh, pool health insurance, create uh, different ways of doing it, whether they're HMOs or all these different styles. Now we're just band-aiding as we go along. Uh, and I hear uh, this talk about how you can't, uh, you can't get any effect on price if you empower the consumer. I disagree, uh, strongly disagree. Uh, in this state, we have too much government involvement. You've got to pull it out and allow, look, we have the best quality health care in the world. There's a reason why Saudi sheiks fly into Minnesota. There's a reason why we, we are very proud of our health care system. Uh, we have the access. People can go to emergency rooms. Is it where we want them treated? No, it's the highest delivery cost we have. So how do you improve access? Well, you've got to lower cost. That's the issue. How do you lower cost? You empower the consumer with more choices. You give them ownership over their own health care, and they will start to make those decisions the, most, uh, the highest value for the dollars that they're spending. That's how you do it. You drive costs down by allowing people more choice. Right now, we've got government making those choices for the people. All right. Tom Emmer, Tom Horner, thank you very much. And we have another question. Yes, gentlemen. Uh, I'm actually running for public office myself for Ramsey County Commissioner Andy Noble. Uh, I'm curious what you guys have studied in other states as far as privatization and wanted to know what your thoughts were about the successes or failures that other states have had with privatization of assets and certain systems. Uh, Tom Horner. Oh, is it Tom Emmer? Okay. Well, I know that in the state of Indiana, I believe it is, the, uh, the state of Indiana has taken their public uh, uh, employees and given them more options with health savings accounts and the like, empowering them. It has dropped costs dramatically, health care costs for the public employees in Indiana, which frankly is a state that's enjoying uh, much success compared to the states around it, which are the traditional tax and spend models, whether it's Illinois, Michigan, or Ohio. Uh, those states are suffering. They're, uh, in fact, uh, their economies are suffocating. Indiana's is growing. This is one. Uh, there's another one, a little different, uh, Minnesota Care. Uh, we proposed a, uh, a change in Minnesota Care that would create a, prime, uh, a private health care premium voucher uh, as opposed to the turnkey insurance program that we've got in Minnesota by some accounts that would save 250 to 300 million a year by allowing uh, the individual who qualifies for the benefit to participate in the private market, getting government out of the business of administering that. Uh, that's been done in Florida as a pilot program and has enjoyed some success as well. Okay, Tom Horner. Well, and I know that, that Representative Emmer frequently uses the Indiana example. I've known Governor Mitch Daniels since my days in Washington when I was Chief of Staff to Dave Dernberger. Mitch was actually the first person I met in Washington was my wife Libby, who was a staff person for Hubert and then Muriel Humphrey, one of the, the later people. The next people I met was Mitch Daniels. And Mitch Daniels will tell you that, yeah, we can privatize some things, but we also need the federal stimulus dollars. Indiana has a much higher unemployment rate than Minnesota. And you know, look at Tom, I mean, what you're saying just flies in the face of, of experience. As a small employer, as a guy who's run a business, I know that in the 1980s, small businesses were being kicked off insurance rolls left and right because we had these huge spikes in premiums. Minnesota got together, made some really smart policy reforms about small groups, and now I've been able, as an employer, to provide really good benefits to my employees because Minnesota government created a, a level playing field. We've done some good things with policy. Do we need to do some better things? Of course. Do we need to do some changes? Absolutely. But we need government as a partner, and I believe that's the reality. All right. Thank you both. And another question. Uh, my name is Wild Cooley. I'm a hospital internal medicine physician here in St. Joe's, actually. I'm going to start, actually, by answering the gentleman question here. He asked about uh, why is healthcare uh, more expensive, and I can give you, you know, two facts. Probably the number one cause for uh, expensive healthcare is end of life care. We spend about 30, more than 30 percent of our healthcare money on end of life. So we start people on, uh, you know, demented people sometimes in their 80s, on uh, hemodialysis with pacemakers. So we use the technology that we have uh, to extend the <coughs> end of life. Instead of making it kind of a peaceful end of life, peaceful short, we extend it to make it long and very expensive. That's the number one probably uh, cause for uh, expensive health care. Number two is uh, pharma, pharmaceutical, the pharma lobby basically, and uh, 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 medication being expensive. When they're allowed to go do, do uh, direct advertising on TV, 
uh, for these expensive medications who hasn't been tested for that long, some new medications, we didn't have them for only a few years, uh, and they're allowed to uh, do public advertising and they have tax deductions on doing these public advertising. And then the patients show up in our offices say, I need this expensive medication. It's very hard for a doctor to say no, and that's a one driver for healthcare. So from here, I would start. You're elected. <laughs> 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 so sorry for this uh, long question, but my question now, what are we going to do about these two things? Number one, how can we do something about end of life care without using it in the political football, you know, death panels, comments, uh, everybody knows. And other thing, uh, what should we do about uh, uh, the pharma? Should, should pharmaceutical companies have tax deductions for doing these direct advertising for medications that are very expensive? All right, so Tom Horner, there's two questions there. You kind of addressed the, the idea that you know, we're able to live longer, uh, and he's kind of coming right. at that from the other direction. R right, and, and so I think one of the things that was lost in the federal health reform because of the way it was politicized was the provision that would incent and provide reimbursement for providers to provide counseling to help people understand what their decisions were. I mean, you talk about an informed consumer, you need an educator to have an informed consumer. And so we ought to incent and, and reimburse providers to have that kind of counseling. We ought to have that kind of discussion. But we also ought to continue with the, the coordinated care for chronic conditions as people lead into the, their end of life decisions. I mean, some of the really interesting things that Mayo is doing with its insured population, substantially reducing hospitalizations by identifying the early warning signs and keeping people out of the hospital. Now again, that involves technology. It includes high-speed internet. It includes the, the interaction. You know, on the, the, the pharmaceuticals, frankly, I don't know what the answer is. I'll throw another problem at you. I mean, it's not just the, the, the long uh, lead time, but I mean, how many different drugs do we need to cure toe fungus? And yet, you know, if that's where the money is, that's what the pharmaceuticals keep developing. We need to incent them to develop the drugs that are really going to take care of the more pressing issues. And I think that's really the greater challenge. All right. Well, there go my dinner plans. Uh, Tom Emmer, <laughs> um, <laughs> without invoking toe fungus, uh, answer no. the gentleman's question. No, I, but before I do, I just want to point out, I'm disappointed that Senator Dayton couldn't be here, but Tom, I just want you to notice that Ted the Tracker from the Democrats is here right in the back. And well, and wave let's introduce him. Abby. Let's be fair and introduce Abby from the Republican <laughs> Who's Party. Abby? Abby, say hi to everybody. Come Good. on, Abby. Who's Abby? Come oh, on. Oh, who's Abby? Good Come Abby. on. Well, I don't <laughs> have any trackers. Do you have any trackers? I've got two. I've got two. You You've only got get two. One. I don't got yeah. any. And and you only get one because I don't believe in that. Actually, you've been tracking me for a long time, so yeah. we're going to count. And I have a I GPS said, in my I car. Both, I don't know what that means. <laughs> as I've said to Abby, just call. We'll set up a time. Abby, we'll spend two hours talking. Hey, you don't have to wander hey, around Horner, in the evening. Stay away from Abby. Yeah. Right? <laughs> now, That's second, in the audience. Second, I, I, Ted's been invited to our Christmas party, so you and Libby are invited as well. Thank you. I have forgotten the gentleman's questions back yeah. there. No, I, I, I got it. Had to do with I got end first, of life care first, and pharmaceuticals. First, I you got I, one minute. I absolutely uh, bristle at the idea that we have to start counseling people on uh, maybe it's your time to go. Uh, it, that's not the right thing. And doctors today, it actually uh, flies in the face of what our great physicians do right now. That suggests that physicians aren't sitting down with their patients and saying, look, this is where you're at. You know, I, I, I've had family members that I've lost and they had very, very direct conversations with their physicians who they trusted about what they could expect. And then decisions were made based on those discussions. Those are happening already. And for bureaucrats and politicians to suggest that they have the answer by, because they're going to create, it's just an excuse for saying, we want to cut off your ability to, to purchase additional health care if you want to for your end of life care. And when it comes to the uh, pharmaceuticals, uh, these are primarily financial issues, uh, but they relate back to the public influence that people buy in government. These are the, the lobbyists, the public influence uh, uh, firms that go out to Washington and get the pharmaceutical industry those uh, benefits. I think that's the, the issue that needs to be addressed. Uh, other than that, it should be a free market. We're running short on time because we want to make sure we get people out of here by 7.30. Uh, we'll take the questions from the people who are up there. You've got 10 seconds to answer your question. We're going to give you each 30 seconds to answer them. I want to make sure we Ooh. get through everybody who is standing. So make them simple. Also, a very <laughs> quick question, but maybe a, uh, a tough response. My name is Jeff Kaufman. Uh, 
I'd like to hear your proposals on economic development for the state of Minnesota and ways to balance our budget because we have to as a state. Federal government doesn't have to, but we do. Tom Emmer. Uh, first off, the budget issue. Uh, you'll hear that we have a $5.8 billion deficit. In fact, the state of Minnesota, based on current revenue projections, the next governor, the next legislature, will actually have almost $3 billion more to spend than it has today. Uh, my colleagues uh, say they have to raise taxes in this state because they got to pay this $5.8 billion uh, deficit. It's a deficit on paper. Uh, in fact, if we agreed, and I'm not saying this because I believe we need to redesign a smaller government, if we agreed we were not going to spend one more nickel in the next biennium and change any program, theoretically based on current revenue projections, state of Minnesota would have a surplus. How do you stimulate the economy, economic development? You lower taxes, you eliminate and streamline the excessive and unduly burdensome regulatory environment you, we have in this state. You unleash the entrepreneurial spirit that, spirit that is in Minnesota, allow your existing employers to start to grow again and make Minnesota attractive to new investment and new opportunity, new jobs. Tom Warner. Well, let me say I do agree with Tom that the deficit is on paper. It's on the loan documents that school districts have had to take out to borrow money to pay for the money that the state stole from them. It's on the loan documents that businesses are going to have to take out because now the state is saying, we want your accelerated payments on, on sales tax. It's on the loan documents that cities are having to, to take out because they've had to cut fire and police. It's not a deficit on paper. It's a real deficit. It is only like somebody saying today, I'm going to go out today and buy a $20,000 car because next year I think I'm going to get a $10,000 raise in salary. Yeah, we're going to have more revenue. The problem is, Tom, the legislature, Governor Pawlenty, spent the money two times over. It is a real deficit that requires real solutions, and most of all, it requires honesty with the people of Minnesota. And so in 30 seconds, can I answer the question? No. That's why I put out a very comprehensive program on my website, horner2010.com, that deals with tax reform, how we're going to lower the, the sales tax rate, broaden the base, do the business tax reform that is going to drive Minnesota jobs, spending cuts, redesign, but also make some investments in health prevention, in early childhood learning, in older adult services, money we spend now so that we'll get a better return down the road. Do yep. I get my clarification at this uh, point real quick? Yes. I, my, I, I, would <laughs> ask, quick. I would ask Tom this. I asked you this in Duluth yesterday. Yes. I, will you agree to take this so-called outline that you've offered as a plan and take it to the Department of Revenue and have them do the runs and show everybody what you're claiming uh, if it really does work? Yep, and in fact, Tom, I have done that to the same extent that you have. Nobody, the Revenue Department has embedded either of our plans. They have looked at the numbers and they said, my numbers add up. But more importantly, Art Rolneck. For 25 years, the senior vice president at the Minneapolis Federal Reserve, one of the most respected economists in this community, he looked at the three plans, yours, Senator Dayton's, and mine. And what did he say? Horner's is far and away the best. I'll take Art Rolnick's word for it. Again, what I will ask again, and very respectfully. I'm going to go out and get a sandwich, you, know, you guys. Is, Tom, this is important because these people uh, want to know that the yep. plans we're offering actually work. Uh, we did check with the Department of Revenue, mm -hmm. and apparently uh, they verified it, but they haven't done the runs. I will tell you, I asked today to have those runs done, and I'm asking you because I'm going to go out and show you that what I'm proposing does work. Uh, I would like you to, to assure everybody here that you are willing to take your so-called plan, give it to the Department of Revenue, and have them actually do the firm runs so you can show it to people in the public. Absolutely. Good. And, and my so-called plan is actually a plan that is called Horner 2010 Minnesota Works, and it is on the website for everyone to see. I'm not sure all the candidates can say that, Tom. Next question. We're going to move as quickly as we can. I hope you don't mind going an extra few minutes. This is getting good. Go ahead. Great. Good evening, and thanks for the uh, lively discussion, gentlemen. Um, I just have a really quick question. Um, uh, if elected, would you support zero-based budgeting with the alignment of the strategic mission for each of the agencies or cost centers to the basic purposes of government in Minnesota? Thank you. Tom Emmer. Yes. Tom Horner. <laughs> yes, I'd, I'd support it, but the reality is we'll never get there. So what we ought to do is outcomes-based budgeting. Start with the priorities that we want to achieve and then back up from there. 
that's a much more effective way to do it, a much better way to do it, and a much more politically viable way to actually get it done. Did you want to add to your answer, or was yes good <laughs> enough? <laughs> well, politically viable, that's business as usual. That's uh, talking about the way we've been doing it, just giving it a little different uh, flavor. It's time that government live within its means. It's time that we set our budgets based on what we have, not what we want. Right. And I would say, I would say that business as usual didn't just start today. It started six years ago when you were in the legislature and have yet to introduce a balanced budget bill, yet to introduce a reform, yet to introduce a redesign, yet to say here's a new way of doing things for six years. Tom, next, actually, next, I, I do have a record that you can go look at. And I and, have. Uh, it, well, then good. Then, then you're misrepresenting it because I have offered reforms, and they're all there to be seen. And uh, I hope these good people will do that. Uh, and I would respectfully ask that uh, if you're going to represent that, you do it honestly and tell folks there have been reforms to Minnesota care. There have been reforms to the legislative process. There have been tax reforms. You name it, in every area just about, I've offered proposals over the last six years. And yeah, you're right. Uh, it's, there's a lot of business as usual in St. Paul. We're looking to change that. And Next Tom, question. if you've had all of those reforms, I can't imagine then why the challenge you have in just putting them on your website. It's mostly because right. of Let lobbyists. everybody see it. It's next, mostly lobbyists. Next question. Hi. I'm uh, having fun with it. Ron, I'm sorry. Ron Hansen, I'm the immediate uh, past president of the Twin Cities Medical Society. And uh, a number of us there look a lot at uh, medical economics. And if you noticed on the Wall Street Journal today, a whole host of um, companies once again indicated that they were going to raise insurance premiums between 17 and some odd percent. And many of us who think about this from an economic standpoint understand uh, the previous gentleman's question on, on increasing premiums as uh, sort of a result of the cost shift that occurs in the true cost of providing care versus that which is reimbursed by state and federal programs. Many of us are quite concerned about upcoming federal legislation that there is the potential that reimbursement rates for federal insurance could be uh, somewhere based near Medicare and Medicare and Medicaid rates and already you've seen that cost shift occur at Children's Hospital where they just sent out a letter last week that said they're going to have to reduce between 200 and 250 FTEs in the hospital and I mean that is in a sense de facto rationing by the fact we're going to actually reduce the resources um, you talk about cost quality and access and most economists will say that you can only have two of those three it is very difficult to deliver all three effectively and maybe can't be done in real economic systems. I guess my first question, uh, and the only one I'll have time for, <laughs> is the direction that the country and the state is going with accountable care organizations. Uh, some of us providing the care are quite concerned that once again the providers will sort of be the de facto backstop financially for how this is going to work. Uh, Minnesota Community Measurement is providing a lot of statistics or so-called benchmarks to try to determine, quote unquote, how well physicians are providing care. And then they will be tiered and rated and accountable care organizations. Can you, can you boil the question down yeah. just so we, we can respect yes. everybody's time? And, and so I think you guys get the, it's complicated, right? And it can't be done. <laughs> yeah, we picked up on that yeah. tonight. So I'm trying to figure out what you, you, you fellas think about the direction of accountable care organizations and how we're going to make people accountable for outcomes. Tom Horner. Yeah. Well, and I think you're absolutely right. I mean, I think if we continue on this path, that, that federal programs will cut reimbursement. I mean, they don't want to deal with the real issue. And so we see that, you know, Mayo Clinic, I mean, the example of Atul Gwandi that often is used, Mayo Clinic provides Medicare at a higher quality for half the cost of McAllen, Texas. We've got to change that. I don't think we change that by pretending that we can get rid of federal health reform. It's not going to happen. We can change it by acknowledging that federal health reform is not the prescriptive plan that some make it out to be. It is an opportunity for Minnesota to engage with the, the federal health reform and to leverage it with some of the accountable care organizations, coordinated care, medical homes, those kinds of, of programs to make sure that everybody is treated fairly, that providers are, are reimbursed at a fair rate, that, that um, Minnesotans have access to high quality health care, that employers pay a fair share and a transparent share when they buy insurance, all of those kinds of things. I don't think we get there by pretending that we can just go to a charity care system for the poor or that we can just bring in more insurance companies and everything will be fine. That's just not the reality of the health care marketplace. Tom Emmer. Well, the, certainly the way we're doing it right now is not working. 
uh, and to say on the one hand that yes, we're absolutely headed there, but on the other hand say that's why we got to participate in every federal dollar that's being offered to us in every federal program, that to me doesn't make sense. Again, I said it earlier, you have to evaluate every federal program as it comes into the state of Minnesota, what's really being offered, but more importantly, what are we committing to for the long term? When you talk about things like this, are we just going to ignore this uh, problem that has been going on now for years? Uh, what incentive is there going to be, not just uh, uh, to provide the care, but what incentive is there going to be to generate the next generation of great physicians that we have in this state if your future is you're not going to even be able to provide the care you're, you're offering at cost? Because that's where we're headed. Uh, it's time to start thinking out of the box. And you know, you can, uh, you can mock the term charity care, whatever you want, but the problem is we have too much government involvement. You've got to allow the marketplace to work and you've got to trust in the people because people in this profession do want to care for their fellow human beings. Give them the incentive and the opportunity to do that. Start to pull government out of the process and you will see the system start to balance itself, I believe. And you know what? If you don't trust it, at least give me the opportunity. At least give us the opportunity because clearly what we're doing is not heading in the right direction. And our final two questions. Go ahead. Uh, hi, my name is Joel Giffen. I'm a medical student. Uh, rural primary care, I think, is um, a, a topic that needs addressing. And as a medical student, I know that one of the only ways to increase the number of rural primary care physicians is going to be a financial incentive um, due to student loan debt. And one of the only ways to do that is going to be to increase reimbursement, to decrease student loan burden, uh, or some other option. I, I was curious, what specifically would you do to increase the number of rural primary physicians coming out of Minnesota? Tom Emmer. First off, uh, primary physicians are in jeopardy, period. Got nothing to do, uh, well, it does have something to do with, uh, you know, what you can offer in greater Minnesota, how many people want to be there. Uh, but primary physicians, you know, where the money is today is some type of specialty. So people are moving in that direction and frankly they're bypassing primary physicians. I think the future, because the primary physician is incredibly important to the future of healthcare in Minnesota, it's not going to happen by continually centralizing uh, the care <laughs> offerings into bigger and bigger clinics. It's going to be empowering consumers so that they can make real choice. Uh, and then when it comes to rural Minnesota, this is a place where I would absolutely say there are things that we can do in terms of empowering the private sector in order to provide programs that will attract people to greater Minnesota to set up their practice, whether it's a loan forgiveness, a scholarship, whatever it might be, we should be looking at every option. Tom Horner. Well, a couple of things. I mean, first of all, we do need, <coughs> excuse me, a robust economy in rural Minnesota, and I've laid out a very specific plan on how uh, rural Minnesota can have that kind of robust economy. But secondly, when you look specifically at our rural health care system, you know, we do have to look at programs like uh, the medical school at, at Duluth that, that is incenting doctors to go into rural uh, practice settings and, and practice. And that does take a role for government, and that's the reality of it. But beyond that, we also need to make sure that those physicians have the opportunity to practice the best health care. And so that's going to take creative programs like St. Joe's Telestroke program where doctors can connect with experts in Minnesota around the country. That takes an investment in high-speed internet. We need to make sure that we're looking at programs like GAMC and we don't impose the burden on rural hospitals and collapse that infrastructure. Otherwise, we won't get doctors out there. And lastly, we need to be open to looking at mid-level practitioners, alternative practitioners, those kinds of, of practitioners that can expand care. Again, St. Joe's a good example with the, the certified nurse midwives. All right, our final audience <coughs> question. I'm Grant Abbott. I'm the executive director of St. Paul Area Council of Churches. Changing topics, I'm not a doctor. Um, I have a workforce question. Tom Stinson, our state economist, Tom Gillespie, our state demographer, have been going around the state talking about the new normal. The fact that in 2020, we're going to have more people over 65 than under 17 for the first time in history. And they also let us know that in the under 17 group, it's growing more and more diverse. And among that diverse population, fewer than 50% are graduating from high school, fewer are going on to college, and fewer are graduating. So as the baby boomers who are now leading many of our corporations retire, and we have a coming workforce that isn't even graduating from high school, where is Minnesota going to get the workforce to be a leader in the global economy? Tom Horner. 
Well, I think that's a great question, and in a minute I can't do it justice, so I would urge all of you to read the editorial in yesterday's Star Tribune that took a detailed look at the education programs of the, the three candidates and said, Horner's the one that we ought to trust, not just on education, but he's the one willing to bring new ideas to the table. He's the one who can bring different parties together to get things done. So quickly, we need to do a couple of things. We need to invest in early learning. We need to make sure children are coming into kindergarten fully prepared for success. We need to allow teachers to teach. We ought to, to turn the schools over to the expertise of teachers and allow them to make their best judgments about how to succeed with the kids in front of them. We need really good principals. Good schools have great principals. That's going to take another investment of money to identify those people who have the skills to be principals, to make sure that um, they have the residency, the mentoring, and then we are going to have to sit down with Education Minnesota and other people and say we do need to make some changes in seniority. We do need to bring in more qualified teachers in some technical areas and do some of those kinds of things, but we also need to look at the achievement gap, how we resolve that. Again, all of these things are, are spelled out, and I would urge you to, uh, to take a look at the proposal. Tom Emmer. Uh, Tom Gillespie, uh, actually to add to what you uh, <clears throat> put out, said that we are on the verge of the greatest labor shortage that we've ever seen. Uh, this is going to be uh, one of our greatest challenges, but it goes back even to what the uh, primary care physician or the uh, medical student was asking. Uh, if you want to fix this, you don't do it by raising taxes and growing more government. You do it by lowering taxes, streamlining regulation, making Minnesota once again the place for opportunity. Remember the 60s and the 70s. This is where people came to go to the University of Minnesota and other great colleges. They got married here and they raised a family here. Why? Because this is where all the opportunity was. This is where 3M, IBM, Honeywell, Control Data. We were growing businesses. We need to get back to doing that. And then when we do, you've got to identify, you can't just let the union boss control where our schools are going. Somebody's got to stand up and say, you know what, this is about the kids, their parents, and it's about the great teachers that we have in this state. We must have alternative teacher licensure, allowing good uh, adults that are prepared to offer things in science and math, because we have a shortage of science and math teachers in our state. We need to allow that so we can attract people into those areas, even though we're still doing well in science and math in this state. We are falling miserably behind on reading in Minnesota. In Minnesota, we have fallen miserably behind in reading. You have to increase the standards that we require our teachers to pass in order to become licensed. Uh, did you know that a uh, teacher in this state can remain licensed for th up to three years even though they can't pass what is essentially a ninth grade basic skills test? We absolutely must recognize that now is the time to take our education system to the next level because today we're not just competing with Wisconsin, Iowa, North and South Dakota. We are competing with the world. And I look forward to having a lot more of this discussion when we have more than 30 seconds. All right. or a minute. <laughs> your, your time is up. Uh, one final question that somebody had submitted, I just want to throw it out there because I think it is interesting and it uh, pertains to what's going to happen in the future. What should the governor do to improve broadband coverage and speed availability statewide, and how would you go about paying for this? And I know when my dad was a doctor, as a radiologist, and he was working up here in the Twin Cities, he used to drive back to places like Hastings and Lesur because they didn't have their own radiologist. Uh, now you can do a lot of this remotely uh, through broadband. So as, we, as this pertains to health care, how important is this, Tom Horner, to expand and improve that system statewide, including in the rural areas? I think it's an essential part of our infrastructure, and I'm the only candidate that has been willing to say that. I think that in some areas, we ought to do it as a private investment, where we have the population density. In other areas, and we're seeing great success in areas like Monticello, it can be a private-public partnership. But there are some parts of the state where it is going to take a public investment, and we need to do it, because long-term, if we want to open the whole state to world-class education, world-class health care, world-class economic development opportunities, high-speed internet will be the highway of the future. It will be to our next generation what the rural electrification was to our parents and grandparents. We need to make that investment and to think otherwise, I believe, is to live with the status quo. And Tom Emmer. Uh, we all agree, contrary to that, we all agree that this is a very important issue for the future of Minnesota. We're ignoring the fact that we have much of this state we already have access. Can it be improved? Absolutely. Where we disagree is government doesn't do this better than the private marketplace. Get government out of the way. 
Look at uh, cities that have actually taken this over. It has been a miserable failure. Uh, take a look at Paul Bunyan Telecom. They're already reaching very small populations up in the very northeastern corner of this state. Why? Because there's a market for it. If government will get out of the way and allow them to make those investments, if there's a market, they will reach it. And that's really what this issue is about. When you let government get involved, it actually slows the process and it gets in the way. All right. Thank you both uh, for taking time. Let's uh, have a, a round of applause for them thank before you. we get to closing statements. Don't go away yet. Nice Tom, don't go away yet. They're each going to have two minutes to give their clothing, closing statement. You don't have to take the whole two if you don't want to. We'll go in reverse <laughs> order of what we uh, started with, and I'll begin with Tom Horner. Well, thank you very much. And again, I think you see clear differences. Look, I got into this race because I do think there is a need for a centrist, common sense approach to, to solutions. But I don't think that the centrist, common sense approach is take a little bit from the right, a little bit from the left, mush it together, and hope it works. We do need complete new thinking about how we're going to approach some of these challenges. It's not just to say government has no role, trust individuals, trust business. There is a role for all of us, for community, for society, to do things better, to do things differently, to do things more boldly. And that really is my message to you, is that this is a year when Minnesota is at a critical crossroads. We do have to make decisions. What has been working in the last several years what has been done in the last several years isn't working. We need to be smarter. We need to do things differently. We need to do things where we have Democrats, Republicans, and independents at the table figuring out what is the best solution, what is the new solution. And I think fundamentally, at the end of the day, the issue that I think is going to decide this election will be leadership. Who has the vision? Who has the temperament? Who has the experience to bring Minnesotans together to find that common ground to move the state forward. And so here's what I would ask of you, a couple of things. First is we need to ask two questions. What kind of a Minnesota do we want to live in and what are we all willing to do for it? And secondly, I would ask you this. If you want bold leadership in the governor's office, it starts with bold leadership among you, the voters. You need to think every bit as differently about this election as I want to think about the future of our great state. So with that, thank you to the host. Thank you. Thank you to Tom and Tom. And it's been a great opportunity to be here with you. All right. Thank you, Tom Horner. <coughs> and now Republican candidate Tom Emmer. I thank you as well, Tom. It is an honor to be here. Think about it. It is an honor and a privilege to run for the office of governor of the state of Minnesota. There is a distinct choice this year. On the one side, you have a couple of candidates that essentially say the same thing that I've heard since I was a young man old enough to understand in this state. Government has run out of money yet again in the state of Minnesota. So what do the politicians do? What do the people that have been involved in building government all these years do? They look right away to the hardworking men and women of this state, to the business of this state, and they say, you just need to pay a little bit more. Uh, you know what? You can talk about tax and the rich. Uh, that's not going to solve your problem when it goes right to the heart of every small business in this state. You can talk about spreading the, uh, the sales tax and dropping it a point, but when you're now going to tax garage sales and the kid who mows your lawn and haircuts, where will it end? I believe it's time for a new direction in the state of Minnesota, and based on the reception we've been getting over the past several months, we believe that a significant number of people in this state hopefully the majority in this state agree with us. It is time to look at government itself for once. It's time to redesign government so that it efficiently delivers the services that people expect and then do what we absolutely must do. Instead of constantly representing government and protecting government at the expense of the taxpayer, let's start to empower the taxpayer, the citizens of the state of Minnesota, to start to grow their opportunities. Let's remember this country, this state was not built by government, it was built by people and it will get moving again if you allow people once again to have the opportunity to realize their full potential. That is the only future that will set Minnesota back on a path to success. Uh, that's the one that we hope to have the opportunity with you to create in the state of Minnesota over the next four years. I uh, look forward to having more of this discussion over the next 56 days. Thank you very much. All right. Thank you, Tom Emmer.